back quickly with Stephen A. Schwartz. He is on the line. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Good. Doing now, well, although I'm a little concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. Okay. What? Are you, tell us, what are your thoughts on that? I'm very concerned about that as well. I've, I've been pouring over notes just recently about it. Well, I lived in Egypt for two years. When I was doing the remote viewing research, the Alexandria Project that found the Lighthouse of Pharos and Cleopatra's Palace and Mark Anthony's Timoni and a, and a bunch of other stuff. And One of the first things I learned was that Egyptians do not think of themselves as Arabs. They say they speak Arabic, but they are not Arabs. They are Egyptians. And they look at most of the Arabs as being what they say Bedouins. They're just uh, nomadic peoples who wandered around in the desert, whereas they, the Egyptians, have a civilization that dates back so old that at such a high level that Europeans, that meant in this case me, could barely <laughs> comprehend. That's the Egyptians are very proud. They have a very clear sense of themselves as Egyptians. And it and it has a huge effect all over the Islamic world. So it's very important that um, Egypt not be radicalized. And now, so we've got to do everything we can to make sure that this makes a, a peaceful transition. And we've got to we've got to do it in such a way that Mubarak is left in an honorable position, and it has he has to see it personally that way. I mean, he has to see it in his gut, and other people, the Egyptians, have to see it. You know, he's been around for 30 years. That's the, something like 40 percent of the population is under 25 there. So uh, it's very that's the only person these people know. I mean, we think about Sadat, but. For most Egyptians, Mubarak is it. I mean, he's been the head of the country for their entire lives. And so even though they may hate him and think he's corrupt and he's allowed the government to become very corrupt, but they would not like to see him treated without dignity. So, it's, you know, it's going to be very important to do that. And we were caught completely flat-footed. You know, we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on intelligence stuff. And we never seem to be ahead of the curve. We're always playing catch up. What are your now? We 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 started right in on the Egyptian uh, aspect. What what years did you live there, uh, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, Seventy nine uh, through the uh, through the um, taking of the hostages, and um, and then the return of the Sinai. Hmm. When Carter now, returned, when when the Israelis gave the Sinai back to Egypt, and in return for what they thought it was a cold peace, but which over time has has uh, proven to be a very durable and important part of that world. That's why it's it, it just it's we really we really have to be very careful that they don't get radicalized. They don't want to be ra that Egyptian society. Egyptians are not radical people. Sure. They, again, yeah. it goes back to this idea. They see themselves perhaps in difficult straits, even though unemployment is enormous and corruption is rife. Egyptians, as part of their self-image, see themselves as the heirs of this ancient culture that goes back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I can't overemphasize that. It's they, It's who they are, and when you offend that in some way, you get problems. Now, uh, Mubarak really has, has, in my opinion, he, he has fumbled the football. He's lost the game. He, he's there, there are credible sources that are coming out saying that the actual pro Mubarak uh, protesters are are indeed police and military in plain clothes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Of course, this is this is the standard way this is how these kinds of authoritarian governments act is that they uh, what they're going to do in egypt i think or what he's trying to do now because they realize that it was a huge backfire to have the violence in the square is they're going to try to subsume it 
by the, oh, how can I put it, the, the infrastructure, the bureaucracy of Egypt will simply accommodate it in a certain way and diffuse it. I mm-hmm. think that's the next thing he's going to try. I don't think it's going to work. I, I believe that the it, what, what's driving this is food, and that's one oh, of yeah. the major trends in the world. If you go back and you look at the Tunisian and all of these these uh, uprisings, they all originally trace back to food because the price of food is going up enormously. And and I don't know, something like 40% of Cairo is lives on less than $2 or less a day. So food, we, Americans just can't even conceive of this, but food is a huge deal. And in the Middle East, the rise of the price of food, particularly wheat and rice, is... Uh, is having a huge effect. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, people do not willingly starve. Yeah, they, they're actually, uh, uh, I, there are reports coming out. The problem is, is uh, the Egyptian government's locking up a lot of the reporters, but there are reports coming yeah. out that they're, they're actually hiring pro Mubarak supporters based off of food, giving them food to protest against the other protesters. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it, this is, there are t- two things are going on. One is Egypt's and the Middle East food crisis would be present no matter what kind of government they had because they are not the principal. They're at effect to it. The uh, uh, And the other thing that's going on is that Mubarak, uh, you're right, Mubarak's government has simply been around too long. It's become too corrupt. It's just it's no longer acceptable to a significant, such a significant percentage of the population that you have an uprising, you have demonstrations. Mm-hmm. That's what's going on, is that it got sufficiently intolerable to enough people that they went into the streets about it. Egyptians are not, they like things to go along. If you look at their history going back 5,000 years, you uh, you see that they have long periods of stability interrupted by brief episodes of great violence mm-hmm. but the normal thing that goes on is is the uh, is stability when when uh, alexander founded alexandria in egypt after he died and uh, they were the, his generals, his sort of general staff were talking about how they were going to split up the um, his empire. Ptolemy Soter, who was uh, older and and uh, wiser than the others, said, "Look, you know, I'm older and I don't want to get into this thrash. And just give me Egypt, I'll be happy." <laughs> and so they said, "Well, okay." So they did give him Egypt. And, the, and they thought that Egypt was not a particularly, uh, at that point, was not as, as significant. That's significant. There were other countries that they thought would do better. And But what he understood was that they had this ancient civil service, and they had a population that was accustomed to having an, a, 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 a functioning civil service. Egyptians liked mm-hmm. stability. Now, and so uh, he asked for Egypt. He was the only one who died in his bed. Mm. That's incredible. Have you actually tried to remote view uh, what's going on in Egypt? Uh, can you remote view the no. future by chance? No, no. I'd be very interested if some Egyptians wanted to do it. That would be interesting. Or if somebody else wanted to do it. I mean, I have a, I have a technique called looking into your future. I have to have a CD that does it. And uh, it's an adaptation of the laboratory protocols that we use in remote viewing, and it allows you to go down a timeline to a specific date and describe it. And I've been getting people to remote view the year 2050 since 1978 and have been fascinated to see the accuracy of what they have described in the process of getting to 2050. Mm. They, for instance, saw the the uh, uh, disappearance of the Soviet Union 
that's what they said, the disappearance. Of, I thought, wow. you know, the space people come down and pick up the soil and take it away, it disappears. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. This was, you know, this is like 82, 83, and I was involved with citizen diplomacy all the way through, and I kept getting these, the Soviet Union is going to disappear. Uh, I had no idea what to make of it, and then, of course, it did disappear. Now, Stephen... You, how did I've got to ask? We got into the Egypt so fast. How did you get into remote viewing? Because you've been doing this for an awful long time. What was the the driving motivation to get you into remote viewing and and into this spiritual path? Uh, the Edgar Casey material. It was that powerful. When I was, 20, when I was well, I don't know. It's just you know when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I had been working uh, in I'd been working in the film industry in New York as a, a writing, and had been very successful. And I I um, I went to a party that Truman Capote gave, and I looked at all these very sort of glitterati people. And I was walking down a hall, and I looked in a mirror, and I said to myself, "You are becoming an unattractive person." And I realized that I had reached a sort of existential moment, that all the things that I thought were important weren't important, and that things that I didn't even know about must be important. And and um, so it's too long for an interview. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I ended up, uh, through a series of synchronicities, being invited down to Virginia Beach. Uh, I lived in Gloucester County, which is... Uh, on the other side of the York River from Yorktown and Williamsburg, you know, those historic sites, mm -hmm. on, the, on the east coast of Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia. So I went down to Virginia Beach, and I, I, they was taken, I was taken up to the Edgar Cayce Foundation, and he, uh, I'd never heard of him, and they were trying to explain to me what a reading was, a psychic discourse, and, and um I walked in and I, at random, pulled down out of his readings that were in these little green notebooks. I pulled one down and opened it up, and um, it described a woman uh, who had been a teacher of astrology at Kermit Qumran, Kermit Qumran, and it was a reading given in 1936. And I knew because I had worked for the National Geographic before I got. Uh, drafted into the army back in the early 60s. I I knew that at the time in 1936, nobody knew that Kerbet Qumran existed. They didn't know that there were any women involved, and they didn't know anything about astrology. But in 1947, uh, a young Bedouin boy chucking rocks into a cave discovered what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they describe. Uh, the, everything that that they describe, it's, it's true. I mean, it, it, so the question was, how did he know this years before anybody else knew it, before it had been discovered? It was predictive, if you see what I mean. He described, uh, it, in this reading, he said, you know, you were uh, you, in a, a, where the Essene community was on the road to Emmaus and blah, blah, blah. It was very specific. I knew immediately when I read it, I just opened this at random. Of course, it, uh, today I would say that it was not random. But in any case, I opened it. At, I just pulled this book off a shelf and opened it up. And this was the last research that I had done to, for this geographic before I had gone into the Army, was this research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is about, I don't know, 1964. Mm. And I thought, my, where did this guy get this information? Where was it stored? How did he get access to it? And that began, that's where this all begins. And I began in the, about 68. I didn't know anybody else who did this. I, I, I got interested in it, and I thought, how could you do this research in as absolutely Im unimpeachable way as possible? And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, you ought to develop a sort of statistical test to try it out, but then to actually make it work, you should um, you should do something in another branch of science which everybody agrees they don't know the answer to. 
And my original idea was to find black holes. But as I got into the research, uh, I realized that there was not there was no chance of that happening. People waited years to get on a on an instrument, and, and they weren't going to give up hours to somebody who thought that what I then called distant viewing uh, could tell them where black holes were. I mean, I just it was implausible. But so as I was looking around, I realized that archaeology was perfect because it was a it was a discipline of science in which. Uh, they spend an enormous amount of time learning about the minutia of a culture. Mm -hmm. Archaeology is fascinating. You know, if you're working with somebody at a level of real excellence, I, I, I once watched a marine archaeologist that I had working as the director of archaeology for a project I was doing. I watched somebody bring him a fragment of a brick and two nails. This was in the Bahamas. And on the strength of that fragment of brick and those two nails, uh, he was able to identify the class of the ship and a, a part of the time period, a, a range within the time period. And, and within about three hours, he had identified the ship. It was unbelievable. Wow. Just as a, as a, as a skill set. So I, as I got into and thought about this, I thought, well, these guys are perfect. Because one of the big problems in archaeology is where do you look? If you look mm -hmm. at archaeological finds, a great percentage of them are made serendipitously. You know, somebody's digging a well, or uh, a guy with a mule is uh, walking down the lane and the, and the roadway collapses, or they're paving a highway and a bulldozer opens up a tomb. Or, you know, it's, an awful lot of archaeology is serendipitous. So I thought, well, that's perfect, because then everybody knows what they don't know. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. don't know where Cleopatra's palace is. If we did, we would have found it. We don't know where it is. We don't know where this buried building in Maria is. And in mm -hmm. many cases, I could compare the electrical uh, remote sensing with the non-local consciousness remote sensing, because I could use... Uh, side scan sonar and proton precession magnetometers and ground penetrating radar and stuff like that. So I was able to compare what was known uh, through normal electrical or anyway technologies with the non-local technology, and I could can see which would be better as the way of do it. And I can tell you that, and I will support it with data, that if you have only one way to find something that people have been looking for for thousands of years and haven't been able to find it, remote viewing is the way to do it. No question about Incredible. it. Incredible. I, I will put up the evidence to show it. You can go to my website, in fact. All the papers are there. And download them. You'll see paper after paper where I had other people, not me, so there's no question about cheating or anything, other people go and um, uh, survey the site, or they had already surveyed it before I got there, and then have a remote viewers locate something at the site. Mm -hmm. All right, we're, we're pretty uh, hip, I should say, on this show as far as remote viewers. We had uh, Paul Smith, we've had Dr. Melvin Morris, oh, no, Paul, and yeah. they, they're both incredible as far as uh, their information. So um, we were really looking forward uh, to this, this uh, conversation still are um let me ask you did you 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 encourage meditation along with your your remote viewing is is did you self teach yourself and and was it just by accident that you started tapping into a, a universal consciousness or or how did you did you actually seek out people to teach I started you? meditating I started mm -hmm. meditating if, if the, I, my understanding uh is today is very different than it was when I started whatever it is 40 some years ago. I I began doing remote viewing completely unconnected from anybody else. I didn't know anybody else that was there wasn't anybody else. There was absolutely not only was I doing this what would today we'd think of as laboratory research, but I was doing this applied work. Um, I mean, I've written about all this in my book, so we're not going to have time to cover it all in in, in a no. interview anyway. But 
but it's I mean I've written a lot of it down. It's in the papers. I got interested in this from the perspective of the nature of consciousness, and I wanted to design a protocol that would allow you to produce an unimpeachable chronology and an objectively verifiable outcome. That's what I, I was trying to do. I wanted to move past all the the occult, psychic, I never used the word psychic, uh, all of that stuff, because I understood that what all of it was, as is all religious ceremonies, they're all rituals that allow you to open to non-local consciousness. Mm-hmm. I didn't mm-hmm. know all that when I got started. What I was trying to do was just develop this protocol. And it wasn't until 1977 when I was doing the submarine experiment to see whether non-local consciousness was electromagnetic. I had finally gotten a submarine. I mean, that's a whole other story about how I got it. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I happened to meet uh, Ingo Swan. And yeah. through him, I met Hal Putoff and Russ Targ and Ed May, who were up at SRI. They were doing the military stuff. I had started a laboratory called Mobius. I didn't want to do classified research. I didn't. I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I understood that other people would feel differently, but I didn't. I thought anything we know about consciousness ought to be out in the open, and I don't want to hear 30 years later about all kinds of misinformation. I just, I think if we know something about consciousness, we ought to put, it all ought to be done transparently. So unlike the SRI stuff, which was all done in secret, all the stuff I did was witnessed by hundreds of people, and we filmed it. Mm. it, it, it there's nothing else like it. I, I, I don't say that. In, I mean, Russ and Hal and Ingo, they're all dear friends, but it was just a different track. I was going down a different track. I wanted to do my stuff in the bright light of public awareness so that there would be absolutely no question about it. And in fact, by the way, there wasn't. Mm. Oh, I mean, over the 40 years, I've had two or three people write negative things about it. And, but you, you can't, you got to deal with it. You know, I mean, if a guy tells you from Los Angeles to go 2,000 miles away and in a very specific pl- point, which he locates on a map, that you'll find a very particular kind of thing, and he then goes on to describe it in detail. In detail. And you break down his description in the concepts. So if I say the radio host sitting at his desk with looking at the microphone, that's one sentence, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if you think about it in terms of concepts, it's radio, host, sitting, uh a table, microphone, it's, what is that? That's five concepts, right? Uh-huh. In in, the, in these practical applied experiments, we rate every concept. There isn't anything else like it. Trust me, go up and look at the papers. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't want this to sound braggy. It's not, it's not what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that, I went at this as a way of looking at the nature of consciousness, and I believed, because of the experiences that I had personally, that it would be that you could get non-local awareness. You could put it in any kind of box you wanted, and you could get it. And so I didn't want to argue with critics. If you look at the literature of the whole field, you'll see that an awful lot of it is spent spending time with deniers. People mm-hmm. and, the, and, the, and the arguments end up in these arcane arguments about statistics. You can look at Daryl Bem's paper that's going to come out in in, uh, in uh, uh, Journal of Psychological. Oh dear, what is it? Um, uh, Psych Bulletin. Mm-hmm. Psychological Bulletin. Um, the New York Times has written about all kinds of people. The, the, the criticism of it is now down to an argument about whether you should use Bayesian statistics or not. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I wanted I wanted stuff to be very, very clear so that average people who didn't have any particular level of expertise could look at it and say, oh, yeah, I get it. And so archaeology was, from my point of view, was perfect because everybody agreed that they didn't know something, Nobody knows where that is. You know, you'd read it in papers. We don't know where this site is. 
So if you could find the site and you could describe it in great detail, down to concepts, not just there's stones there, but there's a block of stone that's three by four by five. Here's a drawing of it. Here's the angle at which you'll see it when you, so you'll recognize it when you go looking for it, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And I wanted it to be, and filmed it. I filmed the whole thing. So not only was it witnessed by lots of people, many of whom were highly skeptical, because I would put together, I do, I'm doing one now, I put together teams of, of, uh, researchers in lots of different disciplines, I don't ask them whether they believe in remote viewing or are interested in remote viewing. I only ask them to do what they do. If I bring you a piece of glass, I go to the very best glass person I can find, and I ask him to or her to say, what is this piece of glass? Or, you know, if it's a piece of metal or whatever, you go to the people who... people. Expertise is very complicated today. There are hundreds of disciplines that, that looks, people spend their whole lives. I'll give you an example in Alexandria. I found an amphora, right? Very good, several of them in very good condition in diving. But they were an unusual shape. And I took them to the, a, a guy named Mikulowski Rajevich, who was then the leading archaeologist in Alexandria. And he said to me, well, you know, he told me what he thought they were, and he said, you know what you really want to know? You've got to go talk to this woman archaeologist who was in East Germany. And he said, <laughs> she, wow. she has spent her whole life studying the left handles of these amphora, and she'll be able to give you a really good answer. And I said, the left handle? He said, oh, yes, the left handle has one piece of information in the seal that's impressed in the soft clay, and the other, the right handle has different information. She focuses on the left handle. And I went and talked to this woman, and she looked at this amphora, and she said this amphora was made by, I can't remember his name now, and he lived in Tyre. Mm. <laughs> I said, Really? She said, yes, he worked with another guy, and then they had some kind of breakup, and he went down the river a little bit where there was another clay deposit, and he started his own amphora manufactory. And she was like she was telling me, my neighbor's dog, uh, you know, chewed on my uh, backyard's uh, roses. and it was, sure. it was just that casual. So you want to have those kind of people do the evaluations and have people watch that happen. And then there's no argument about it. It's, we're not arguing about whether you use Bayesian statistics. It's you either found it or you didn't find it. It's very straightforward. Now, uh, Paul Smith, in in his remote viewing, and and from what I understand from Melvin Morris, uh, they they are not doing the meditation. Are are you? I, I'm, I'm trying to ask this. Question. Oh yes, I lost that point. I'm sorry. The reason. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the, the 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 reason meditation matters is that the, one of the keys to opening to non-local consciousness is the ability to form and hold an intention. There are, three th <clears throat> excuse me, there are three things that matter about remote viewing that we know that we can manipulate. Four, actually. Intention, numinosity, an entropic process, and uh, ge uh, geomagnetic field, and local sidereal time. Those are things we know will allow you to optimize the ability to remote view. Scientific remote viewers don't, none of us do the CRV technique. Nobody in science does that. Not because, I don't know whether it works or doesn't work, there's just no research to support it. So I, I have no way of evaluating it. There's none of the, none of the remote viewers I've worked with uh, do this. So that that's all part of that army project that came out. And there are apparently some very good remote viewers, uh, but I don't, I can't look at the research the way I can look at uh, Ed May's research, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, or the way I can look at my own research, or the way I can look at uh, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Group, 
or the Mind Science Foundation, or uh, I don't know, some, I can't think of anybody else, right? Uh, or Noetics Institute of Noetic Sciences. Mm-hmm. You know, I, Do- any of that research, I can look at it, I can see the results, I see what's going on. Uh, so I can't, I don't know very much about CRV because there are no papers to read, and I have mm-hmm. not taken the course, so I don't know. I don't know what they think. I will tell you what I think, and that is those three things, intention, numinosity, and entropic process. Meditation will give you the ability to focus your consciousness. That's what it trains you to do. It trains you to open to the part of yourself that exists outside of space-time. And that's why, why do I believe in meditation? Because study after study shows that meditators do better than anybody else. I believe it not because I have some polemic or ideological or theological commitment to it, but because that's what the data says. You want to be a good remote viewer? Meditate. Do you experience out-of-body experiences? I mean, does that happen when you meditate? Is that part of the remote viewing? Very, 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 very few people have out-of-body experiences. Most Mm -hmm. of what people mean by out-of-body is uh, uh, remote viewing. The dislocation of the... uh, People do have them. I have had one. No, two. But it's not common. Mm -hmm. Mostly when people talk to you about out-of-body experiences, they're not talking about out-of-body experiences where the locus of your awareness is in a different place from your body. That's... (laughs) That's a very different experience. It's it, mostly when it happens, it's so overwhelmingly disorienting that fear springs up in your back in your body almost instantly. Mm-hmm. It's, it, 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 it just doesn't happen very often. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because it does, but but let's say 99% of what people mean by out-of-body experiences is um, is a form of non-local awareness. Remote viewing should be seen as a protocol. It's just a protocol. It's like a ritual. In fact, it's exactly like a ritual. If you think about it, the only way you could think about having non-local awareness over the last, until about 500 years ago, was in religious terms. There wasn't any other way to think about it. There was no context. It's only with the development of science that the idea of an objectively verifiable thing arises. Everything else before that is empirical. And when you had an experience, and I mean, uh, Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, or I mean, there's, there's hundreds, thousands, you know, uh, it was always seen in the context of, um, of oracular uh, religious experience. The oldest remote viewing that's on record, period, is in the 46th chapter of Herodotus. And it's uh, it's the remote viewing that was done for Croesus. And it, it's, it's, it, it was, it's an outbound experiment. That is, there's somebody who's at a distance from the viewer that is um, exactly the same as the way we would do it today but it was done within a religious context, if you see what I'm trying to say here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Religions develop rituals to allow you to open to non-local awareness. If you look at all the world's religions, all the major ones anyway, forget about the dogma. Just look at the ritual. You will see they all have the same basic things. You designate a specific space where you're going to have this, this gathering, The gathering is explicitly designed to open to non-local consciousness, God, the creators, whatever. Um, You gather together, you make a statement of intention. If you're a Christian, it's the Nicene Creed. Um, You make a statement of common intention. That's part of the linking process that goes on. Then you have chanting, drumming, singing, or some combination of that. You have a period where you focus, prayer, whatever you want to call it, where you focus quietly and you you may have someone stating an intention, a prayer. You 
have an experience. Uh, if you're if you're a charismatic, it's speaking in tongues, or if you're a voodoo practitioner, it's a manifestation of one of the gods. If you're, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just go on and on and on. Now, it's the same thing. It's all about mm-hmm. opening to non-local consciousness. Remote viewing is just a secular, scientific way of doing it. Yeah. Now, do do you believe in? You do not believe in coincidence, do you? Well, it's more complicated than that. I think that. Um, I think that we have we do not have upward causation or not we do not only have upward causation we also have downward causation and um the non-local domain is a, it seems to be from everything i can see a domain of information so uh people who open to this are not if you look at what they say you will see that, for instance, the relationship between genius, religious epiphany, and a remote viewing experience, that these are all the same experience. They simply have a different context and intention. Uh, a, a genius, or not a, a creative, a person who has a moment of creative genius is trying to solve something. They're trying to, as Brahms says, I'm in an altered state of consciousness and the music comes down to me or Mozart, or Copeland, or this young boy that was just on CBS 60 Minutes. He said, I hear the music. I write it down. Mm -hmm. Um, That same thing you can see, Picasso looking at the canvas till he could see the painting, Michelangelo looking at the marble until he saw the statue. So it's simple. You just take away everything that's not the statue. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. Or Tesla (laughs) saying, I saw the... Uh, electric motor is a vision as I was going across the park. Or um, Einstein is saying that the theories of relativity came to him one day when he was idling in a, in a canoe. On and on and on and on, you see w- w- whether it's creative genius, whether it's um, uh, uh, a religious epiphany, or whether it's remote viewing. that They're all talking about this sense of connection to a greater whole, this idea of the linkage of all consciousness, uh, this sense of being in a timeless time, a spaceless space, all of those kinds. And those same words come up over and over and over again. And, and, and if I took out what it was, who was speaking, and I just put the words in, you wouldn't be able to tell in many cases whether it, uh, whether it was a creative genius speaking, uh, religious uh, ecstatic speaking, or a remote viewer speaking, describing what the experience of remote viewing is like. Well, I'm, I'm having what I'm thinking right now in my mind is is we're looking at this. I'm wrapping this back around to Egypt because we're seeing a tremendous event there. We're seeing a mass movement of people in coordination and. I, yeah. I want to ask you, is that the the non-local awareness driving those people? Is is it something outside of this realm that we're, we consciously see that is that causes us, like you were talking about the words, it doesn't matter who speaks and they just come out. Are we seeing something beyond this world driving those people, uh, if that question makes sense? Absolutely, of course it makes sense. In Egypt right now, what we're seeing is both local and non-local. Part of it is local, just like part of your mind is local, and part of it is non-local. It's, it's why did all these people suddenly come out? I mean, one guy went out, and suddenly everybody else said, "Yeah, that's what we got to do. Let's go." That's what happens. You, there is a. If you look at, for instance, Roger Nelson's Global Consciousness Project. Roger was part of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Group. He's been running this for years. He's looking. He's got. He's looking at random number generators that go non-random when there are mass consciousness events, like the death of uh, uh, Princess uh, uh, Diana. I haven't talked to him uh, this week, so I don't know whether he's got Egypt. Whether that showed up. But if you went to his website, you'd be able to find out easily enough. Global Consciousness mm-hmm. Project. But what he's what he's looking at is that this linkage of consciousness. So part of what's going on is that the gestalt 
of Egypt reached a point where suddenly a lot of people said, that's enough. I'm going out into the street. I mean, think about that for a minute. You know, the original 10 or 15 people that did it, they could have gone out in the street and made a lot of noise, and everybody said, you know, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Go home. <laughs> you know, have a cup of tea. <laughs> That's not what happened. Yeah. They went mm-hmm. out into the street, and suddenly everybody looked at each other and said, you know, they're right. Let's go. And they all walked off. That's what happens. because it, And it happens quicker than you can just explain it in terms of people communicating. You know, like I'm going to call up three friends, and they're going to call up three friends. And that's that's part of it. But there is another part of it where it, the, the concept has to be pregnant in order for it to be given birth in a public outcry like that. This is a this is a collective public outcry. Mm-hmm, see mm-hmm. it that way. It's just like in, in in the United States, we are now going through a great schism that arises because of a presentment effect. A presentment effect is knowing something is going to happen, having your body physiologically respond to the event before it happens. And there's a whole body of research on this. Now, when when you are entering one of these meditative states, do you get? I want to. I'm going somewhere with this question. Do you get chatter? Do you have chatter? Do you hear uh, potentially like Earth consciousness? Do you hear uh, basically that that there's the, the crud is getting ready to hit the fan, so to speak? I mean, no, 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 no. I don't. It's nothing like that. Uh, by the way. You can go up. I've got a, I've got a CD on this. I'm not trying to pitch this. I'm not trying to sell it, but it's just that's a simple way to answer. Or you can go up on my website and download for free. It's all all these papers. It's all for free. You just download it. Um, is uh, there's a thing on meditation uh, that you can get instructions for meditation. I I have a meditation called Meditation for Modern Minds which is based on all of the latest meditation research. You know, m- many meditation techniques developed uh, thousands of years ago in a world very different than the world we live in today. You know, if you were a 2nd um, century BCE uh, farmer or a monk, you probably didn't travel more than 5 or 10 miles from the place you were born. Uh, most of the colors you saw were earth tones because uh, that's what was available. Um, most of the music, the loudest noises that you heard were would be a cymbal or something like that. You know, uh, people didn't travel. They didn't have a lot of stimulation. Um, they just lived in a different world. Mm-hmm. That's why I think people have, a lot of modern people have a hard time with meditation. So I went through all the literature. There are probably a thousand papers in the last 15, 20 years. So big literature on this subject. And um, out of that, I culled together a technique for meditating. And so that's the best I can recommend to you is just go there and download it. it doesn't really, that being said, it's the technique. This business of being obsessed with technique is is, um, is, a, is an inadequate understanding of what's going on. The key to meditation is to meditate. It doesn't really mm-hmm. matter what technique you use. I mean, I've got a technique, which I'm happy to share with anybody that's interested, but what's, um, it's much more important to me that you do some kind of meditation, some are better than others, and but that's, you know, when you're up at that level, that's a completely different issue. It's just sitting, it's like playing the piano. Not everybody is, um, uh, you know, is going to be Rubinstein or, or uh, uh, George Winston or, I don't know, I can't think of somebody right now. But in any case, you have to start. So it's much more important that you start the discipline of meditation. It's hard to do. It's the simplest thing to do, and it's hard to do because all of the robot behaviors that run your life most of the time, and most of our life is completely reactive. Um, We only have about 18 minutes of original thought each day. Uh, 
most of the, those robot patterns will rise up. They don't want they don't want you to reabsorb the energy that they represent. Think of them as apps, maybe. You know, you have an app. You, you learn very early on, don't put your hand on a hot stove. I mean, you don't do it but once. Every little child, I don't care how young they are, they put their hand on the stove, they never do it again because they, it's imprinted on you very quickly. Don't put your hand on the stove. Well, we have thousands of those little patterns that run our lives. We think of them as sort of being creative, but in fact they, they run our lives. So if you doubt it, put your watch on your other arm and just watch how clumsy you become. Um, now, what, so you have to break those down, those patterns, and reabsorb that energy into yourself. You can transform yourself with meditation. Guaranteed. Uh, absolutely. It comes with a guarantee. But you've got to do it. What I, I guess what I was trying to ask is that there seems like there is almost I, I'm reading it online. You know, I'm I'm in uh forums all day long and I'm seeing an energy. I don't know if it's a hyped up energy that, that people are making themselves, but then I, I turn on the news and I see it started with Iceland and then we go to Greece and then we go to uh the, these other countries in Europe, then we go to Tunisia, and then we go to Egypt and we it seems like there is almost a, a energy that that is is in the subconscious of people that's bleeding not, not, through. Not energy, Sanchez. Information. It's all about information. What's happening is is that all over the world we are going into a a a a level of transformational change that we have never seen and no one we know has ever seen. And no one our parents knew had ever seen. You know, there are periods of time when history changes fundamentally. Between the 8th and the 2nd century BCE, humanity awoke all over the world. Buddhism, Confucianism, Jainism, uh, Deutero-Isaac, Judaism. With, between 800 and 200, in that little space of time, all of the major religions that we think about today arose but more than that, the whole idea of of our world view changed from uh, in a just historically a few hundred years a blink of an eye we are going to go through one of those kind of changes because we have climate change coming up because we refuse through willful ignorance to acknowledge what we're doing, and so it's going to be too late to do anything about it. The United States is becoming majority non-white country, which is causing enormous stress for a lot of people. A lot of several states are already majority non-white, and more than that, we're going from the bipolar world, which is the only world most of us have ever known, the Soviet US bipolarity, to a multipolar world. And um we're going through an energy transition. It's a kind of perfect storm of, of transition. And people sense that precognitively. They have a presentment about it, the physical and, and mental, emotional. And there are two basic ways people respond to those kind of things. They either respond out of fear, anger, resentment, the world's being changed, that's not what I want, it's not my world, I'm unhappy, I'm bitter. That's the whole Tea Party movement and Glenn Beck, and he's the perfect <laughs> voice of it. You know, I mean, seriously, a million. Uh, he, listen, he has a million point seven visit, a million seven hundred thousand viewers. He's going down, but nonetheless, it's a million seven hundred thousand people, and they listen to that stuff day after day and believe it. Mm -hmm. It's very important to recognize the role of willful ignorance that's going on in our country. That's one of the responses. I'm simply not going to look at it. That's what's going on with global climate change. You know, all these incoming Republican congressmen, to a person, I don't believe it. Uh -huh, now, you uh -huh. can show them all the evidence you want. They don't believe it. It's, it's, we have nearly 50% of the United States was 51% the last uh, the Roper last Roper uh, and Pew research poll um, believe that the world was created within the last 10,000 years. <laughs> now that's impossible. If you cannot believe that and 
have anything to say to astrophysics, physics, geology, paleontology, anthropology, biology. I mean, basically what you're left with is clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have millions of people in the United States who hold that worldview. It's not like they know better. They sort of secretly in the dead of night look at their spouses and say, ha, 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 you know, I I know it's really much more than that. No, they believe it. What's going to happen to these We people? have enormous willful ignorance that's going on, and it's part of it is a response to this precognitive awareness of this enormous change that is about to take place over the next 10 to 25 years. But by 2050, it'll get better. But between now and 2050, it's going to be a hair-raising ride. Hair-raising. Uh. What's going to happen to these people that are, I mean, you, you touched on a spot. I wish we had more time. Um, by the way, I, I agree with your stance on Glenn Beck. I, I cannot, uh, I'm pretty vocal about my stance on Glenn Beck. Uh, what, what's going to happen to these people that, that literally have their heads in the sand? Are they going to make it? Are they going to make it? Well, they're going to cause enormous obstructionism. And we're not going to be ready for most of this. So what could have been handled in a fairly elegant way is going to be incredibly messy, and it's going to result in a great deal of suffering and death. Mm. That needn't necessarily happen. We could deal with all of this if we were willing to deal with data and not ideology. That's a point I was trying to make to you earlier. When you think about things like remote viewing or you think about things like Egypt, I mean, they seem disconnected at one level, but at another level, they're not because they're both expressions of consciousness. And when you're dealing with consciousness, because it, it's, it's a domain of information, it's not a space-time domain, the only way you can deal with it in space-time is either have the experience, and then you have to be able to objectively measure it and to make it real in, in space-time. So you have to look at data, whether it's data about energy or it's data about uh, an archaeological site. We need to rely on data, not our ideologies or philosophies or theologies or any of those sorts of things. We need to rely on data, and data is very clear. We are going through sea sea rise, we're going through warming, we're going through drought, Look, people don't distinguish between climate and weather. We need, we, we are being, we need to change our perspective. We need to wake up. And I, I don't think it's going to happen, so I tell people you need to focus on your local community and how your local community is going to get through. I agree with that. What if We've got about seven minutes, actually six minutes left. I, I want to ask you uh, if, if you can give a, a somewhat – concise answer as far as people's health what is the the most single most important thing they can do to to maintain their health and their mental outlooks through the the upcoming times um eat locally produced foods develop the practice of meditation and um exercise that's a pretty That'll good combination. It. That'll do it. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you have to maintain health. We know how to do that. It has to do with eating stuff. If you're eating processed foods, you're eating fast foods. You got a problem. You need to eat well. Uh, 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 I eat organic food, locally grown, unless I am pushed to do otherwise. You have to push me to get me to do something. But normally, my wife and I eat locally produced organic food. Go to you, you work out at least three days a week. Walk in nature, very helpful, and meditate every day. If you do those three things, uh, you'll get you'll be very clear about what you need to do. Mm-hmm. I'm not worried about that. Those just do those three things. They, they, uh, that will get you through because it will open you up to insights that you would not otherwise have that will tell you what you need to do. I can't tell everybody what to do. That's a movement. But I can tell you that there are three processes that we know will give you the most 
the highest probability of having a a healthful life, of being well in the broadest sense of well, and that's mm. eat properly, exercise, and meditate. Okay, and we we're, we're yeah, our minutes are running out fast. I think time's speeding up. Uh, and you had a charity that you were wanting to plug at the end here, and that was? Uh, uh, Whidbey Island Nourishes. And you can Google it, Whidbey Island, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y, Whidbey Island Nourishes. It's a charity. My wife's involved with it. I'm involved with it. Uh, many of our friends. It feeds all of the homeless kids and all of the um, uh, couch surfing kids. Uh, Whidbey Island, where I live, which is off the coast of Seattle, we have about 25% of the of the community is on food assistance. Wow. And our community has a or biodynamic organic food bank. It gives out only good food. It's wonderful. It's really quite extraordinary. And Whidbey Island Nourishes is a group of volunteer women who make about 1,200 lunches a month. Mm. And on the weekend, they, yes. s- they send kids home with what they call backpacks. They, they give them enough food to get through the weekend. So okay. that these, uh, from little children to teenagers, uh, eat right. Because if kids don't get good nutrition, they can't possibly concentrate. Absolutely. They can't possibly behave. You know, it's we know how to do all these things. We know that mothers need to have prenatal care. If a woman doesn't get the right proteins between the 19th and 23rd week of pregnancy, her child's brain will not properly develop, and he'll never or she will never be what they could have been because their brains don't develop properly. We know that. It's a no. <laughs> this is a no-brainer. We know Absolutely. that early childhood and uh, uh, preparation sets kids up. If you can get them set up right by the age of seven, they will turn out much, much better throughout their lives. We know all of this. I mean, we again, we have the data. We just don't choose to pay attention to it. But Whidbey Island Nourishes is the charity that I'd like to support. I really appreciate anybody that will send anything into them. Um, those are really decent people who do extraordinary work with young people who really need the help. All right, Stephen, we're, we are really close to being out of time here. Will you give us, uh, plug your what, your book, your websites for us? Oh, sure. Uh, www.stephanaschwartz.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-A-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z.com. Stephanaschwartz.com is my personal site. You can get all books. CDs, free downloads, all sorts of stuff. And my daily web publication is uh, www.schwartzreport.net, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z-R-E-P-O-R-T.net. Or you can go to the Huffington Post and Google my name, and you'll find my essays up there. Beautiful. Good to Um, talk to you. Good to talk to you. I want to thank you again for coming on the show and and invite you back in the future. Back quickly with Stephen A. Schwartz. He is on the line. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Good. Doing well, although I'm a little concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. Okay, what you, tell us what are your thoughts on that? I'm very concerned about that as well. I've I've been poring over notes just recently about it. Well, I lived in Egypt for 2 years. When I was doing the remote viewing research, the Alexandria project that found the lighthouse of Pharos and Cleopatra's palace and Mark Anthony's Timony and a, and a bunch of other stuff and one of the first things I learned was that Egyptians do not think of themselves as Arabs. They say they speak Arabic, but they are not Arabs. They are Egyptians. And they look at most of the Arabs as being, what they say, Bedouins. They're just uh, nomadic peoples who wandered around in the desert, whereas they, the Egyptians, have a civilization that dates back so old that at such a high level that Europeans, that meant in this case me, 
could barely <laughs> comprehend. That's the Egyptians are very proud. They have a very clear sense of themselves as Egyptians, and it and it has a huge effect all over the Islamic world. So it's very important that um, Egypt not be radicalized. And now, so we've got to do everything we can to make sure that this makes a a peaceful transition and we've got to we've got to do it in such a way that Mubarak is left in an honorable position. And it has he has to see it personally that way. I mean, he has to see it in his gut. And other people, the Egyptians have to see it. You know, he's been around for 30 years. That's the something like 40% of the population is yeah i mean it's it, it's it, it, this is there are t- two things are going on one is egypt's and the middle east food crisis would be present no matter what kind of government they had because they are not the principal they're at effect to it the uh, uh, and the other thing that's going on is that mubarak uh, you're right mubarak's government has simply been around too long it's become too corrupt it's just it's no longer acceptable to a significant such a significant percentage of the population that you have an uprising of demonstrations mm-hmm. that's what's going on is that it got sufficiently intolerable to enough people that they went into the streets about it egyptians are not they like things to go along. If you look at their history going back 5,000 years, you uh, you see that they have long periods of stability interrupted by brief episodes of great violence. Mm-hmm. But the normal thing that goes on is is the uh, is stability. When when uh, Alexander founded Alexandria in Egypt. After he died, and uh, they were the, his generals, his sort of general staff were talking about how they were going to split up the um, his empire. Ptolemy Soter, who was uh, older and and uh, wiser than the others, said, "Look, you know, I'm older, and I don't want to get into this thrash. And just give me Egypt; I'll be happy." <laughs> and so they said, "Well, okay." So they did give him Egypt, and, the, and they thought that Egypt was not a particularly, uh, at that point, was not. And when you offend that in some way, you get problems. Now, uh, Mubarak really has, has, in my opinion, he, he has fumbled the football. He's lost the game. He, he's there. There are credible sources that are coming out saying that the actual pro Mubarak uh protesters are are indeed police and military in plain clothes. Oh yeah, absolutely, of course. This is this is the standard way. This is how these kinds of authoritarian governments act is that they uh, what they're going to do in Egypt, I think, or what he's trying to do now because they realize that it was a huge backfire to have the violence in the square is they're going to try to subsume it by the, oh, how can I put it, the the infrastructure, the bureaucracy of Egypt will simply accommodate it in a certain way and diffuse it. I Mm -hmm. think that's the next thing he's going to try. I don't think it's going to work. I I believe that what's driving this is food, and that's one of the major trends in the world. If you go back and you look at the Tunisian and all of these these uh, uprisings, they all originally trace back to food because the price of food is going up enormously. And and I don't know, something like 40% of Cairo is lives on less than $2 or less a day. So food, we, Americans just can't even conceive of this, but food is a huge deal. And in the Middle East, the rise of the price of food, particularly wheat and rice, is... Uh, is having a huge effect. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, people do not they, willingly starve. Yeah, they, they're actually uh, – uh, there are reports coming out. The problem is, is uh, the Egyptian government's locking up a lot of the reporters, but there are reports coming yeah. out that they're, they're actually hiring pro-Mubarak supporters based off of food, giving them food to protest against the other protesters. 
Um, yeah, that's significant. That's significant. There were other countries that they thought would do better. And But what he understood was that they had this ancient civil service, and they had a population that was accustomed to having an, a, 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 a functioning civil service. Egyptians liked mm-hmm. stability. Yeah. And so that he asked for Egypt, he was the only one who died in his bed. Hmm. That's incredible. Have you actually tried to remote view uh, what's going on in Egypt? Uh, can you remote view the no. future by chance? No, no. I'd be very interested if some Egyptians wanted to do it. That would be interesting. Or if somebody else wanted to do it. I mean, I have a, I have a technique called looking into your future. I have a, I have a CD that does it. And uh, it's an adaptation of the laboratory protocols that we use in remote viewing, and it allows you to go down a timeline to a specific date and describe it. And I've been getting people to remote view the year 2050 since 1978 and have been fascinated to see the accuracy of what they have described in the process of getting to 2050. Mm. They, for instance, saw the, the uh, uh, disappearance of the Soviet Union that's what they said, the disappearance. Of, I thought, wow. you know, the space people come down and pick up the soil and take it away, it disappears. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. This was, you know, this is like 82, 83, and I was involved with citizen diplomacy all the way through, and I kept getting these, the Soviet Union is going to disappear. Uh, I had no idea what to make of it, and then, of course, it did disappear. Now, Stephen... You, how did I've got to ask? We got into the Egypt so fast. How did you get into remote viewing? Because you've been doing this for an awful long time. What was the the driving motivation to get you into remote? Under twenty five, there. So, uh, it's very. That's the only person these people know. I mean, we think about Sadat, but for most Egyptians, Mubarak is it. I mean, he's been the head of the country for their entire lives. And so even though they may hate him and think he's corrupt and he's allowed the government to become very corrupt, but they would not like to see him treated without dignity. So, you know, it's going to be very important to do that. And we were caught completely flat-footed. You know, we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on intelligence stuff, and we never seem to be ahead of the curve. We're always playing catch-up. What are your – now – we, we we started right in on the Egyptian uh, aspect. What what years did you live there, uh, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, Seventy nine uh, through the uh, through the um, taking of the hostages, and um, and then the return of the Sinai. Mm. When Carter now- returned, when when the Israelis gave the Sinai back to Egypt and in return for what they thought of as a cold piece, but which over time has has uh, proven to be a very durable and important part of that world. That's why it's it, it just, it's, we really, we really have to be very careful that they don't get radicalized. They don't want to be, ra- that Egyptian society, Egyptians are not radical people. Sure. Again, yeah. it goes back to this idea. They see themselves perhaps in difficult straits, even though unemployment is enormous and corruption is rife. Egyptians, as part of their self-image, see themselves as the heirs of this ancient culture that goes back thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I can't overemphasize that. It's, they, it's who they are. 